Our Father, we thank you for the song of commitment we have just sung. I we want you to take us serious, but we mean what we have sung. And by your grace and enablement, we will live up to it. Grant us your grace. Teach us things we do not already know. Remind us of things we are fast forgetting. Plant our feet on the rock. Make us consistent in our worship and service. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's please be seated. This morning we are talking and sharing together on the man God uses beyond his gifts and beyond his generation. Perhaps we have thought of this topic before, we have listened to such a topic before, the man God uses. But we are particular on God using us beyond our gifts and also beyond our generation. Nothing gets done in the world, whether religiously or on a secular basis, without a man or some men. Nations are not built with brick, cement, or mortar. Nations are built with men, by men, on men, through men. And so whether it's in the world or in the church, whether it's in a family or in the missionary field, the work of the Lord is done by men who offer themselves and surrender themselves. But then there are men that are working that God has not been using. In Mark chapter 16, verse 20, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord walking with them, and confirming the word of science following. Those were men that God used. In Hebrews, the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 2 and verse 4, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his will. These were men that God used. And as we are looking up to the Lord that God will use us, I want you to notice seven things in particular on men that God uses. Number one, they are called. Not only that they have been saved, not only that they have experienced the love of God and the grace of God in their lives and in their hearts, they are called. Moses was called. He knew it. Joshua was called. He knew it. David was called. He knew it. Jesus was sent by the Father. He knew it. He often said so. He was a called man into the position and the privilege of the Messiah. Aaron was called back in the Old Testament. Peter was called. Paul was called. Because God called them, God could use them. And if there is anything we, we ought to find out uh, at the beginning of our ministry, is that we are called. Not just that we go. The Great Commission is for the whole church. Therefore, there is a sort of general assignment for every member of the church. But there is a special assignment for those that are called. And that type of call is not something that an individual gets into by just uh, saying, well, I think I like to do this. I think I would like to put myself into such a thing like this. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 4, And no man taketh this honor unto himself, 
but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. How do we recognize the call of God? One will be internally led, sometimes gently, sometimes the impression is so firm, and the pressure of the hand of God on us is so heavy, and the leading in that direction is so clear, and the door that opens into that field uh, is uh, wide open, and we can see it, and our spirit can reach not the handwriting on the wall, but the handwriting on top of that open door, saying, enter in, and I will go with you. Apart from that, there is an uneasiness. In any other type of job, you feel uneasy in any other thing you do. Even thinking about it, thinking about any other profession, any other employment, any other involvement in the world, you think uh, it's uh, going to put you in a real difficulty. You only feel at ease when you are in that direction. Apart from that, you feel the joy of the Lord while the opportunities are given. And uh, when you then step into the um, platform of that opportunity and you eventually minister, whether people are saved or not, there is a gentle witness within you that you are in the right thing you ought to be doing. You are called. Men God uses are men that are called of God. In John chapter 15, verse 16, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. There are men today that have chosen the work of the Lord full time or missionary work or evangelistic work but for those that are called ye have not chosen me but I have chosen you for those that are chosen it's so difficult for them to get out of it like Peter the more he tried the more God impressed him through Jesus Christ that you have no alternative, you are called. Lovest thou me more than this? You can't easily get out of it if you are called. If you get out of it and you feel convenient, it means originally, actually, you didn't have the call. The pressure may be hard, the problems may be great. But when a man is really called, chosen of God, the more he tries to get out of it, the more he finds it miserable in life. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. When God is uh, as called and we're fulfilling that call, we realize something. We go forth to bear fruit, and that fruit remains. That whatsoever ye ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Not only called, they are cleansed. The men that God uses, number one, they are called, they know that call, they feel that call, and they feel at ease only when they're in the direction of fulfilling that call. But just being called is not the only thing that you find in the lives of people, in the ministries of people that are called, that are uh, going to be used of God. They are cleansed. There is the general cleansing that God gives to all the members of the body of Christ. And we all partake in that cleansing. In John chapter 15, verse 3, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. And uh, that general cleansing is a necessary cleansing. We are cleansed from sin, from the various sins that plague humanity. We are called of God, and we are called because we have been cleansed. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness, and from all your idols, will I cleanse you. Now, as I've said, we all receive the general cleansing. We are cleansed from sin. We're cleansed from all the works of the flesh. Our lives are transformed and we are changed. 
but in particular for the people that are called of God and for the people that God is going to use. He gives them a thorough cleansing. There are things that become idols for missionaries or ministers they have to be cleansed from. There are things that God regards as sin for his own ministers that may not necessarily be seen for uh, the people who are in the church by and large. For a member of the church to be a successful businessman will be all right for him. For a missionary to love money to the point that he leaves the missionary work and he wants to be a businessman at the same time, that will be an idol and a sin. And he wants to be cleansed from that. For a person to be an ordinary Christian and to have, uh, you know, posters and handbills about uh, himself and about his business and to promote that business and advertise that business and uh, to have, uh, you know, cards all about uh, projecting himself, that may be necessary for his business. For a minister of the gospel, a missionary, to have the picture of Jesus uh, on one side of the page and his own picture on the other side of the page, that may become something else. Seeking fame. For a Christian politician, wanting to be famous so that you can vote for him, that may be all right. But for a missionary, for a person that God is going to use uh, to want to project himself and uh, to become famous, that may be another thing. And for self-love, uh, to be pronounced in the life of a minister, a missionary, it's a terrible thing. In Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. There is a way that applies to the general... Uh, body of believers, but then there is a peculiar way in which that applies to us as ministers. Have you ever seen that uh, flesh is indulged? Flesh doesn't like, uh, you know, to kneel down in just one place for one hour, for two hours. Flesh will resist. Isn't that something that the flesh ought to be trained in? And we shouldn't give the baby flesh the chance to just have its way all the time. And when you kneel down and the flesh is screaming, saying, I can't take it anymore, I can't take it anymore, it's inconvenient for me. You silence that baby flesh. And you say, no, you must come under control, under discipline. And also it says, filthiness of the spirit. There are a lot of things that will be filthy, that will be dirty for your spirit that you shouldn't allow to just pass into your spirit. Isn't unforgiveness a filthy thing for the spirit? Isn't it dirty before the Lord? Isn't uh, wanting to revenge, whether cleverly or in a foolish way, a defilement for the spirit? Some emotional traits in the home between husband and wife, the way the spirit will react, I mean the spirit of man, the heart of man, want to put the other person down, a wife down, or just discourage the other fellow, not having any feeling for the other fellow, isn't that just filthy for the spirit? And yet, if we're going to be the men that God uses, we must be cleansed from the filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. Now, it, if we go down to even needing cleansing from any tendency to drink alcohol, I think that would be terrible. If we go to the point of needing cleansing from uh, tobacco, that would be terrible. If we need a cleansing from uh, immorality, real, outright, open immorality, uh, that's something else. And Well, if you need cleansing from those uh, things, Better get the cleansing than cover up. But then if we have degenerated to that point, I think it's terrible. But the point is, we must be cleansed if God is going to use us. Number three, men God uses are, number one, called, number two, cleansed, number three, caught and cultivated. 
pruned or caught and cultivated. In John chapter 15, verse 2, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch in me, every branch that beareth fruit, he purges that it may bring forth more fruit. Regularly in our lives, if we're very close to the Lord, God doesn't pamper us, pet us, just uh, tap us at the back, smile all the time, saying you are doing well. The nearer you get to the Lord and the nearer uh, you get to the life of Christ and the greater you get used in the vineyard of the Lord, the more he courts you. Because there is a tendency to, be, to feel bigger and uh, to feel greater. And if God is going to continue to use you, he'll be cutting you to size every time. Have you ever seen men, uh, even in the natural, who don't uh, cut anything down in their lives, their diet, they don't cut anything down? And uh, whatever they want, they give themselves of luxury, of convenience, of food, of dieting, of clothing. What happens to them? They become bigger than the door in their house. And you know sometimes you can be bigger than the door that leads into the sheepfold. Because nothing is being cut off any time. And uh, your pride makes you, you know, completely bigger than getting, into the do getting through the door into the sheepfold. You cannot minister to the sheep anymore. But you know, the Lord does us this favor, and it's wonderfully good, that when he knows he really wants to use us, he knows he has called us, he knows that he's cleansing us, he also knows he must cut us and cultivate us. Cut prune, purge. And very regularly, you'll find the Lord himself doing it. Otherwise, you will not be used for a long time. You understand there is the lifespan of a burning candle is shorter than the lifespan of a shining bulb. And the lifespan of a shining bulb is uh, shorter than the lifespan of a shining star. And when you talk of the sun, that's another thing. When you are talking of the stars that shine for not only a generation, but for two generations, for three generations, uh, there's a lot that ought to be done. And uh, those stars are far off, far away from uh, the people of the world here. The candles are nearer. The bulbs are farther away a little bit. That's a little bit of an allegory. That, uh, there are people that are useful, but their usefulness is like that, the light of a candle. And uh, there's not much to their lives. They shine, that's true, but then just for a short time. But if our shining, if our usefulness is going to go beyond a generation, then we know that uh, there must be some courting and some cultivation. Now, number four, there is a cleaving. We are called, we are cleansed, we are caught and cultivated, then we cleave unto the Lord. It's the abiding life that bears fruit. In John chapter 15, verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. I am the vine, but ye are the branches. Let's be satisfied with being just branches. Don't take the place of Christ himself. Be a branch and be bearing fruit. Let's give Jesus Christ this position that he only can stand in the vine, the stem, the real tree, and the root on whom the church is built. Let's be contented to being branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me, ye can do nothing. Cleave unto the Lord as the wife cleaves unto the husband. More than the wife cleaves unto the husband. Good days cleave unto him. Bad days, if there are days like that, cleave unto him. Rainy days, dry days, difficult days, perplexing days, problematic days, and the good days, all the days cleave unto him, abide in him. Because if God is going to use us, we cannot take um, vacation from fellowship. 
from fellowship with the Lord. We ought to be with the Lord every time. Sometimes the burden is great. But then even the greater the burden uh, may be or may become, the more we ought to cleave unto the Lord. If the Lord is going to use us, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Number five, they are consecrated men. They are called. But how many men have you seen that are called, but not actually consecrated? They are cleansed. How many men have you seen that are cleansed, and they are not consecrated? Oh, you said, but... Uh, before we are sanctified, before we can be fully cleansed, wholly cleansed, entirely cleansed, mustn't we be consecrated? Well, consecrated to the love of God, consecrated uh, to God in the sense that we want the cleansing above any other thing at that point so that we can be made holy and sanctified. I'm talking of the consecration of the minister of God. In um, Isaiah chapter 50, verse 7, this is the consecration that men that God uses will have to possess all their lives. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 7. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. It is consecration to God and his cause but only one single cause in the whole wide world the consecration of jesus christ looking to the cross alone the climax of his life the apex of his life the thing that he was looking for the devil came and uh, that was the major thing the devil was fighting he wasn't fighting the miracles he wasn't fighting the healing as much as he fought, wanting to get to the cross. And he said, if you'll just turn this stone to become bread, then how will we know? Then we'll know that you are the son of God. But no, he had a cause, and he was consecrated to that cause. If he jumped down from the pinnacle of the temple, but then Jesus was consecrated to one cause. If you bow down, I'll give all the kingdoms of the world unto you. But he was consecrated to one cause. The consecrated man knows how to reject gifts from the devil. You know, the devil said, I'll give you this if you'll just bow down. Those who are not consecrated, they say, praise the Lord. If that thing is coming, if the finance is coming, if uh, the property is coming, if that vehicle is coming from any source, I will take it and use it for the glory of God. The consecrated man knows how to reject gifts from the devil. He set his face like a flinch, and he was just going in that direction. You know, Peter came to him and said, this will not happen to you. But Jesus was consecrated to just one cause, and he said, get thee behind me, Satan. The consecrated man is able to recognize the temptation to live an easy life. The temptation to forsake the cause for which you are created and for which the Lord has chosen you. The consecrated man is able to distinguish the difference between the sympathy of men and the genuine, con the genuine concern that men have. There are times that uh, all that men have for you is just cheap sympathy that will make you deviate from the course of your life, from the things you really ought to do. But the consecrated man will set his face like a flint. Eventually, he went uh, to Gethsemane and he prayed. All at the same time, it was still the cross. He was on that cross and the people said, Now you come down from that cross and we'll believe on you. But he was consecrated to that single cross. He died. To the Roman soldiers, it appears it was, uh, he had been defeated. What a shame. That's what they thought. The consecrated man is temporarily, is temporarily willing to undergo the shame. They will think temporarily he has been defeated, but the single cause is still there. Those three days um, behind the scene, 
I don't believe Jesus was resting. I believe that he was still consecrated to the, to the uh, cause. And then the third day, he rose from the dead. And he came to his own disciples, still following after that single cause. And by the time he was going away, will you at this time uh, bring uh, the kingdom to Israel? Tarry for that power. And then you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth, from beginning to the end, just to one cause. So then, the man that God uses will be consecrated. Consecrated to God, but not only that, more than that, consecrated to one single cause in your life. In Philippians chapter 3, reading from verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, of, G of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Number six is crucified. Is called. Have you, have you known any man that remains on the missionary field for more than one year, for more than five years, for more than ten years, without a knowledge, infinite knowledge of the call of God upon his life? It's difficult. Cleansed. Have you seen a man that uh, remains on the missionary field and then is bearing about a guilty conscience because of sin? because of idols, because of indulgence? Have you seen a man that remains in the missionary field when the secret falls become open faults and the people already know this man is living an hypocritical life? You know, you cannot remain. Have you seen a man that is, um, you know, eating and uh, eating and becomes overweight, lives an indulgent life, and on finance is not faithful, on food is not faithful, on females is not faithful, on fame is not faithful. He just wants everything. You know, his direction is uh, over in, an overindulgent person. Have you seen a man like that remaining on the missionary field? It's impossible until he submits himself for cutting and cultivation. Have you seen a man that is, you know, going afar from the Lord? It's not cleaving to the Lord anymore. Following the Lord afar off. Quite, the quiet time is uh, no more regular. Personal devotion, family devotion, no more regular. Knowing the voice of the Lord, following the Lord, no more regular. And uh, he is uh, dry, he is, um, you know, winding up, he is, you know, getting tired. Even to be able to get message from the Lord is so difficult. Everything becomes so secular and everything becomes, uh, you know, something that he just takes out mechanically, mentally from the Bible. Can he long remain on the missionary field? It's impossible. Have you seen somebody who is not really consecrated to one cause, remaining there, whose uh, passion and driving force in his life is not just to see Christ exalted and Christ uh, preached and proclaimed and people getting saved, whose um, ambition is no more just to preach uh, Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Can he remain? It's impossible. If he remains, will God take him serious and use him? No. But then number six is crucified is crucified you know that man that is crucified listen to me is not in a law court defending himself all the time when we talk of the crucified life it's not just the pain of the crucifixion it's the attitude that that man has it's uh, you know on the cross it's not uh, naming those accusers one by one and saying if i ever forgive uh, so and so then he'll know that uh, i'm not so and so you know, the man on the cross is not getting to the court and fighting for his right. You know, the man on the, in the, on the cross, crucified, is not asking for, who is the person that hurt me? Who is the person that spoke about me? Who is the person that doesn't love me? You know, the man on the cross that is crucified has no time for that. The man on the cross thinks about what is undergoing and wants to know, God, are you still there? My God, my God, are you forsaking me? Into thy hands I commit my spirit and my cause and my life. That's the man on the cross. He is crucified. You see, at the same time, getting all that he wants, you know, on the cross, you don't get what you want. You have vinegar to satisfy your thirst. 
And can you grumble and complain when the thing is tasteless and not tasting well? The only thing you can do is just to reject it and say, I'm sorry, that's not what I want. But you know, you cannot fight for, you know, what you want when you are crucified. You cannot go to the law court and defend yourself when you are crucified. And you cannot uh, be running after people that are against you when you are crucified. And you cannot be saying, uh, where is Peter? Where is John? Are they all leaving me alone? No, on the cross, the only thing you can do is, uh, John, behold your mother, mother, behold your son. As for me on the cross, God is sufficient. That's a man that is crucified. You hear a lot about the crucified life. And all they're saying is, uh, you know, the, just the sins on the threshold. That when you're crucified, all your sins are taken away. Well, that happened long ago. For the missionary is a crucified man. And on the, on the cross, while he's crucified, is just him and the Lord. In Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, I'm reading verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. On the same cross with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. Can somebody who is crucified actually live the self-life anymore? Somebody who is crucified still live the life that, uh, you know, wants this and wants that and is indulgent on this area, on that area anymore? No, yet not I. The crucified man doesn't live anymore. His natural self doesn't live anymore. But Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. The life of the crucified man is a life of faith. A life totally depending upon the promises of God. Because that crucified man is on the cross and is open and those soldiers can see him and they, can, they may come to want to break his bones. All he has defending him is the promises of the Lord that not one of his bones will be broken. He is crucified, and is there crucified with the Lord. And the life he lives, he now lives by faith. It's not living by, uh, you know, the natural talent, the natural ability, and the one that is still kicking, and the one that is still saying, I know who I am, I can do this, I can do that. No, the crucified man lives by faith. The faith of the Son of God, who loved me, how much the crucified man depends on the love of God. He has to. Because there is no other support beneath him. He has to. Because there is no other protection above him. And then, because he gave himself for me. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory. Save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom the world is crucified unto me. And I unto the world. Number seven, the man that is uh, going to be used mightily of God is clothed. One is clothed with humility, and two is clothed with power. Clothed with humility. In First Peter chapter five. First Peter chapter five, verse five. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Ye, all of you, be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. If you watch the lives of contemporary ministers of the gospel, you might discover that very few are like men in Bible days. Very few get uh, used of God mightily for more than five years. Really used of God. Really used of God. And um, I don't know which uh, of the contemporary men that you've seen in our present day. But sometimes you've been reading about some men before. Before they ever traveled to two, three, four, five countries of the world. Those days they'll be so humble. And they'll be used of God mightily. They stand up and they preach uh, some simple messages that you don't think will get anybody saved. And thousands are getting saved. 
And doors have been open, op open to them that, uh, you know, they just, uh, in a supernatural way, they are connected with uh, the people, put it this way, the people that hold the keys to the cities of the land. God just brings them along. And while they are talking to them, they just know that this man has the key into this country or into this city. And if he opens that uh, door, uh, they can have a crusade, they can have a church, they can have almost anything. The first uh, two years of their lives. But then uh, they get this success. They preached in crusades and they pastored churches and they have counseled until sometimes they just touch a person like this and the person gets sealed. Or they come to the platform and while they're still preaching, the person is getting, uh, getting delivered and getting healed. And the witches and the wizards are confessing. They're saying, since this man came into our country, we have not been able to operate anymore. And the person now is no more, is still called of God, but no more closed with humility. And everywhere he goes now, he says, um, you know, he's the first man in the whole world. And right now, if he touches you, you get healed. And if he preaches everybody, you are going to get saved. There is no way you can come into his meeting and not get saved. No matter what type of sinner you are, you will get saved if he preaches the gospel unto you. Because everywhere he goes, 100% of the sinners, they get saved in his meetings. Exaggeration comes in, lying comes in, pride comes in. And then he is no more closed with humility. You know what happens? The usefulness stops. People don't get healed anymore. They don't get saved anymore. And the power of God, the anointing of God leaves him because he doesn't know the secret of being used of God. The lower you go personally, the higher God takes you. The more humble you make yourself, you close yourself with humility, the more God magnifies you. The lower you descend, the higher God takes you. That's the way God works. He resists the proud, but then he gives more grace to the humble. And it says, be clothed with humility. You know, if God is going to use us in this generation, and also beyond this generation, beyond our gates, we need to be clothed. Clothed with humility. Then in Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued or clothed with power from on high. Now you've seen that uh, there have been ministers who have sought the face of the Lord. They needed this endowment of power, this clothing of power, and uh, they got it. The time they got it, you, you sensed it, you knew it. The Lord was near to them. They were near to the Lord, and power was being manifested in their lives. But in my study of the scriptures, I've uh, studied, this man I've been telling you to, I told you last night to study, I study them, I don't know how often. Because I, I can see that many of the things, uh, the difficulties they had, personally, secretly, the things that are recorded in many of their lives, I've discovered some of them. Not all of them, but I've discovered some of them in my own lives. And the things that uh, God, God got angry uh, with them for in their lives, you, you think about them one by one. I've discovered, you know, sometimes the tendencies were uh, coming up in me. And I've got to say, ah, ah, watch it. That's what Moses did. Be very careful. I've got, uh, you know, sometimes to say, ah, watch it. Uh, that's uh, the same thing that uh, Paul got in trouble with. Uh, you know, those, Paul, very good man, good apostle. But, uh, you know, sometimes Paul as a leader, he was a real leader. Sometimes he wants to have his way. And when he says John Mark will not go on with us in this missionary journey, it was so. And unfortunately, Barnabas was also a strong-minded person. And when those two people meet together, there is trouble. They almost stop the missionary work. And uh, Barnabas said, uh, you know, John will have to go. Paul said, I'm sorry, he cannot go. Paul, do you forget? Separate unto me Barnabas first and Saul. Are you getting ahead uh, too much? Or is it because you become the chief speaker on the field? 
John Gwen will not hurt you. John Gwen will not destroy you. You can just swallow that thing and allow this work to go on. Barnabas, well, if uh, Paul says um, John will not go, two wrongs will not make a right. Why not drop this issue? And let us face this call of God, John or no John. After all, the Holy Ghost did not mention John. Somebody has to step down. But you know what I discovered? I discovered that before, as a leader, I stepped down for nobody. I'm the leader. I'm the leader. If the work will be crumbled and go down, that's all. I must maintain my leadership. But you know, as I study the Bible, I find sometimes that even when you feel you are right, you have to step down for the salvation of souls, for the progress of the work. And uh, study these people that I've uh, given you. Uh, it's on the outline. You'll see them one by one uh, today. Who are we studying today? Yeah. We're studying Joseph. And uh, just concentrate on him and study him. And maybe when we come together to share together, we might be discovering some things in their lives that are useful to us. But the point is, you'll discover that in the lives of these men that we studied, there were some things in their lives that will be very beneficial to you. I discovered that even though uh, Moses had the power of God at the beginning of his ministry, an outreach, very, very often he fell on his face before the Lord. And I found that the prayers I preached when I was seeking the Holy Ghost baptism, that prayer is not enough to carry me through to the end of the ministry. Every time I must find time to still pray to the Lord, tarry before the Lord, and you know that the apostles, there were other times they just waited before the Lord, tarried before the Lord. We know about grace, we know about faith, but then there is still the need to tarry. Even Jesus Christ himself, there were times he came apart. There were times he called the disciples and said, let us go apart, let us come apart. Wait on the Lord. Seek the face of the Lord. You know Paul the apostle, he said, in fastings often. There are some types of fastings that are just compulsory for you. When there is no money, fasting is compulsory. And there were times Paul suffered that. But then there were times when there was money, there was food, and there was a person to cook, there was everything. And Paul knew that at this time, I just must uh, fast the flesh and feed the soul, or feed, feast the spirit. And there are times like that you will need to wait, wait, until you'll be endued with freshness of power from on high, so that you are clothed with power. Men God uses are men that are called, men that are cleansed, men that are caught and cultivated, men that cleave to the Lord, men that are consecrated to one goal, to one cause in their lives, men that are crucified, men that are closed. The man God uses never tries to use God. You know, that brings an insult on God when we want to use God. And uh, those who are here in Nigeria, they know that by the grace of God, I never try to use God. I know when the anointing is there, when the power is there, and I just do what he wants me to do. We never try to pretend we are more than what we have. We just allow God to use us. Surrender yourself as a rod in the hand of Moses. Surrender yourself in the hand of God and let him use you as he pleases. And we never use God for any selfish ambition. He presents his gifts to God and is ready to serve. And if you'll present those gifts to the Lord, you'll discover that God will use you beyond your gifts. Think about the rod of Moses. God used that rod more than the ability that you could ever see in an ordinary rod. And if you give your gifts to the Lord, the Lord will use that gift. If you will hand over the loaves uh, to the Lord, the Lord will extend the loaf beyond the feeding of the household. You know, before, it, uh, before the loaves were handed over to the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ, the loaves at best might just feed one household. But when they were given to the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ, God extended the loaves with heaven's resources, and they could go farther than their friends and farther than their household. They feared thousands. And in your life, you'll discover that your gifts, they are small until they are presented to God. 
they are limited until they are presented to God. But once they are presented to God, and it is God using those gifts for his own glory, the possibilities of those gifts are not limited. Then beyond this generation, just take two men. There are many we could consider in the Bible, but take Moses and take Paul. One from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. One in the Old Covenant and one in the New Covenant. One with Israel and one from the church. Their usefulness uh, extended beyond their generation. Take Moses to start with. Through him, the nation was preserved to live to the coming generation. And his work lived after him. The nation lived after him. You remember how many times the Lord would have just uh, wiped off that uh, generation in the wilderness? But it was because of this man of God that God used beyond his generation through his prayers of intercession that nation was preserved. True. He had uh, trained other ministers, other rulers or leaders in Israel to continue after his departure. For well, you have not seen the training that Moses gave to the people. You know, God gave him all that the Levites will do, and he wrote everything down. He called Aaron, and he put everything in his hand after he had been consecrated. And he told Aaron the responsibilities of his sons and the responsibilities of the Levites. Those workers numbered into their thousands. But uh, Moses just carefully trained those people and wrote all those things in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and in Deuteronomy, telling them, these are the ways in which you will sacrifice and the, the ways in which you will carry on the work. What do you think of a man like Joshua? Now, Joshua was following Moses about all the time. And uh, that Moses trained Joshua. He sent him out, but then while he sent him out, he was on a mountainside. He was lifting up the rod of the Lord, and Joshua was having victory. At last, after Moses left, after Moses had died, you know what God had to tell uh, Joshua? God told Joshua, you wouldn't need any more than, jo more than Moses had told you. The book of the law with which Moses had trained you, let it be in your mouth. That's all you need. And all the victory that Joshua had, it was based on just meditating on all that Moses had taught him. That was a man, I mean Moses, that lived and uh, ministered and was useful more than his generation. Number three, divine revelation recorded. God gave uh, Moses divine revelations and they were transmitted to the coming generation. Those people were useful. Think of how busy Moses was, always on the move. As the cloudy pillar will move before them, the cloud of fire, will, the pillar of fire will move before them. They were always on the move, and it was uh, whenever they needed water, they called on him. Whenever they needed manna, they complained to him. Whenever they were getting discouraged, they grumbled and they were grumbling about him. And yet he found time to record divine revelation. Suppose he administered and there was nothing left for the uh, coming generation. Suppose he administered and there was nothing left for the people that would live after him. He would not have been useful more than that generation. Number four, his life and example was shining like a bright star and is still a challenge to us even today. You know his sacrifice, you know his consecration, you know how he will not be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And he accepted to suffer reproach and shame uh, with the people of God, with the children of Israel. And that life is still an encouragement to us today. Isn't he useful even in our generation today? Then um, let's look at Paul on the other side. The church was preserved because of him. I'm telling you that without the epistles of uh, Paul the Apostle, the church would have been wiped out at the time of the Dark Ages. Nobody will know the right hand from the left hand. Nobody will know about the doctrine of Christ, the mysteries of the kingdom, without the, thing that, uh, the things that Paul had preserved. Not only that, he was the person that just uh, spearheaded the growth of the Gentile church. You know, if we depended on the Jewish church today, where will the church be? Because right now, the Jewish church is not continuing as such. They have uh, been forgotten. You go to Israel today and you don't see the Jews, uh, you know, having a strong church. 
But you know Paul the Apostle, he just spearheaded and uh, worked uh, very seriously for the Gentile church. And uh, where do we see the church today on Gentile land? In America, that's Gentile nation. Any nation that is different from Palestine, from the Jews, that's Gentile, British, Africa, Asia. Where the churches are going on today, I about was born is Gentile, Billy Graham, Gentile. All these men that you have heard about, uh, Gentiles, I about those of us today who are carrying the gospel on through deeper Christian life ministry, we are Gentiles. You know how much we owe to Paul the Apostle because his usefulness extended beyond his generation? That's what the Lord wants to do through us. He doesn't want the light that you have to be the light of the candle that burns off only in one night. Only to serve the family in one day. He wants your candle, he wants your light to shine beyond your generation. You know how Paul the Apostle trained uh, ministers? He trained um, Timothy, he trained Titus, he trained others, and then he passed it on to Timothy and he said, don't forget the training. Our life work depends on it. Don't forget the training. The continuation of the work depends on it. He trained ministers that will continue after his departure. Now, many times we say that uh, we're grateful to God for the life of Paul, that he wrote um, 13 or 14 of the books of the New Testament. That is true, but... Do you forget that Luke that wrote the gospel according to St. Luke was a companion of Paul? Do you forget that Luke that wrote the epistle to the, uh, sorry, that wrote um, Acts of the Apostles, that he was a companion of Paul? Well, that means then if you combine all the 14 and then the two, um, the two books, Luke and Acts, you have a lot coming from the influence and the training of uh, Paul the Apostle. That man did much by the grace of God. Divine revelation recorded and transmitted to the coming generation. Thank God for those who are interpreting the Bible, but it was nobody that wrote the original thing. There will be nothing to interpret. And so uh, there are people that are now interpreting all these epistles. You know how many films have been made with uh, Paul? You know how many books have been written because of Paul? You know uh, what things are considered on missionary journeys and missionary techniques through the life and the journeys of Paul the Apostle? His life and example shone brightly and is still a challenge to us today. And he preached and evangelized daily. Thousands in his own day came to the Lord. Millions in our day are coming to the Lord through him after his death. And uh, about us today, uh, we should know that the Lord has chosen us. We ought to be men and women that God can use. And if we we'll surrender our gifts to him, then the Lord can use our gifts. Now there are men you have uh, seen and you wonder, well, they were called of God. You know, Eli was called of God, very much so. But I don't know how much I don't know how much caught or cultivated because we are told it was so heavy that when he heard of the taking away of the ark of the Lord, he fell down, broke his neck. That heavy, weighty, fat man just died like that. I don't know how much he cleaved to the Lord because uh, the Lord said that uh, they that honor me them I will honor. But uh, he has not been able to successfully cleave unto the Lord. Was he consecrated with his house? Was he crucified in the language of the New Testament? Was he clothed with the power of the Lord till the end of his life? We doubt very much. Has he been useful after his generation? Well, the Lord just said, I will even cut off anybody in his family that will even have any nearness uh, to the priesthood at all. We don't want to be like that. We want to be people that are useful today. And through our influence, through what you are planting in the nation where you are, you are planting a successful uh, work of the Lord, that uh, the work will still remain after if Jesus starts, after you have died, and other people will take over. Or uh, after you have uh, you know, established the work, there are the people that are trained in various parts of that country, and uh, your influence will be felt why not in every province of that nation where you are? Why not in every city, in every village of that nation where you are? Why not if not 
It can be if you just surrender yourself and your gifts to the Lord. And then from that place can also be scattered people to other nations from where you are. And uh, you'll be useful to people of other languages. It can be. It has been for other people. But remember, we must be called and cleansed. Called and cultivated, cleaving and consecrated, crucified and closed. All these things that I've said unto you, one way or the other, I'm saying to myself as well. Regularly, I'm always looking at my life and I'm saying, Oh Lord, what will it be? In which way do you want me to be useful? Beyond my gifts, beyond my abilities, and beyond this generation. How much can I do? Just a little at a time that I can be useful so that uh, it will not just end for just a few days. Because I've seen people who are more clever than myself. I've seen people who are more knowledgeable than myself that, uh, you know, those early 70s, we started together, different ministries. And I looked up to them when they preached and I just said, my, my, these people are preachers. And I was ashamed to just uh, stand before them or stand near them and preach. But then, you know, today, not quite uh, 15 years, they're not preaching anymore. Even in their own generation, their usefulness has, you know, all stopped. Now we hear of them, some of them are businessmen, some of them have gone back into lecturing, some of them are, you know, some of them were full-time uh, ministers of the gospel, dynamic and very forceful in those days. But now nobody knows uh, anything that is going on. I think the candle has uh, burnt uh, to the very bottom. And when the candle has burnt, burnt to the very bottom, well, no other thing again. But uh, therefore I have to be reminding myself that I'm not better than those people. If it happened to them, it can happen to me. If it happened to them, it can happen to you. But always to remind myself of the call of God. And not allow anything to, uh, to make me deviate from that call of God. Always to present myself to the Lord, saying, Oh Lord, cleanse me. Oh, you say you still need cleansing. Aren't you sanctified? I believe I am, but you know every day I just see where I'm different from Jesus Christ. And I say, Lord, if I'm going to be like you, I need cleansing on this area. But then I know it because, uh, you know, it's in my life. And when I neglect those areas and they're growing up and I say, Lord, I need another cutting. And I go to the garden of the Lord and thank God he does it every time. And you know when he does it, and he does it by your asking him and permission, it's not as painful as, you know, it would have been if it wasn't by your permission. And all the time I'm saying, I don't want to lose my hold of you. Just abide in Christ. Cleave unto the Lord. And... Uh, I want to consecrate more today than I was yesterday. Be crucified today than I was yesterday. And uh, you think I'm humble enough? If you think like that, you don't know me. I know myself. But I'm all the time telling the Lord, saying, thank God people say I was humble, I'm humble. But Lord, uh, thank God they say that. But you know. And I know there are areas where, Lord, I just need to come before you, just bend lower before you, kneel uh, before you, and just go lower than I ever had been. I find all that is necessary every day. And I think maybe it will be the same with you. Rise up and let us pray. The Lord can use you. He wants to use you, and he will use you. But take note of these points. Tell the Lord... Father... We bless your name for a moment like this. Father, we are grateful that we are members of this particular ministry. Where you yourself are dealing with the people and with the leaders and with every one of us. Thank you, Almighty God, because of all that you've revealed to us this morning. It's because of your love towards us. And Father, we will ever remain grateful unto you. Because you don't want us to become empty cans that will be used and thrown away. But like the Apostle Paul, you want us, O oh God, to bring ourselves under. And then to be people who will be used of God and then we will not become castaways. Our Father and our God, we thank you very much for the call 
unto this particular mission field that you have sent us. Thank you because like you called the people of old, you have called us and we believe you are with us. But our Father and our God, with all that we have had this morning, O oh God, will be shown the man that God uses, the areas of his life that God himself will want to walk upon, areas that he will need to yield himself unto God. Lord God Almighty, we are praying that as you have called us, we just don't need the general cleansing alone. We want the cleansing of the minister, O oh God, that you will cleanse us to the point that you will actually make us fit for your use in Jesus' name. Our Lord and our God, we are praying that, Lord God of all grace, you know us even better than we know ourselves. And we don't want to live to the point that the congregation or the people we are ministering unto, we know the things that we ought to expose ourselves before you about. But Father, we are praying, O oh God, that no secret fault will remain in the lives of any of us in Jesus' name. But Father, we are praying, O oh God, that as we have come together this weekend, we will be completely transformed, O oh God. And in all those areas where Father self is wanting to come up, pride is wanting to reign, and another thing is wanting to sit on the throne instead of Jesus, Lord, we are asking, O oh God, that every idol will be broken down this week in Jesus' name. And that